There's a pretty one, Ulysses. There it is. Hello, BookTube. I'm Sean the Book Maniac. Welcome back to another Friday Reads. And I thought about chancing it to go out. It's very cloudy. It's supposed to rain any minute and the ground is dry, so it was a little tempting, but I do have a lot of books that I would have to lug, and if they started to rain, so many of them are library books, never mind, I don't want my own personal books to get wet, so here I am, but this should be the last indoor Friday reads for quite some time, I hope, and I should have a new blouse to debut for my next Friday reads, stay tuned. I think it's somewhere in Saskatoon already from the airport, but it's not here yet. If it uh, comes in the next few minutes, there might be a wardrobe change and <laughs> debut it here. I was going to withhold this personal news until I knew with more certainty, but I have about 90% certainty and I don't have any other personal news, so I will tell you that my fantastic news, which is that it's looking very, very certain that Kenji will be here in early September. In other words, that he will fly here, he will start living here, he will move here in early September. The stuff that he's got to take care of, the last date that that's supposed to be all done is the end of August. The immigration processing has speeded up. It helped that they didn't stay on strike very long and that should be done even earlier. So early September is is the uh, target date and I'm so excited. One, we're going to book the airplane ticket probably this weekend. Once that's booked, it's going to feel more real and the time will fly by. It's still, what, four months? What are we? We're in May, so let's say June, July, August. So about three and a half months or something to wait. Um, that's going to fly by, but oh my God, it's been such a long wait. So I, you can just imagine how absolutely delighted I am. You know, once the ticket's booked, there still might be changes, but I don't, a very small chance of any changes. So at long last, my husband will be joining me in Canada and we have will have been apart for so long that it will be like kind of starting over and also that our marriage to be honest our marriage in tokyo was so weird those what was it three years three and a half years because all he did was work so i'd only see him for like 90 minutes a couple hours of quality time a week so no this is going to be a real fresh start i'm a little nervous but mostly just really really excited and god i've been lonely for too long so, I'm going to insist that he make at least a brief appearance on one of my Friday reads, or, yeah, probably Friday reads, once he gets here. So stay tuned for that. So you all know that I'm not, he's not just a figment of my imagination. <laughs> I was beginning to wonder myself. So happy, happy days. I don't have any Patreon news for you today, and I don't have any other news. So here is the Week in Review. I haven't actually been checking the NYRB recent publications. Are you uh, okay? What's wrong with you? Uh, what's wrong with me? I'm in a <laughs> book buying ban. I've been shopping too many books. Uh -huh. Well, I hear you. Look at, look at this. Here's the opening paragraph. I'm going to do my best with the pronunciation. Awoicho Atakole was terrible with dates. Anyone who knew anything about him knew two things for certain. He never questioned his bill whenever he made purchases or was out drinking with friends. That was one thing. The second was that memorizing dates and figures was his biggest phobia. He was afraid of numbers and dates and was terrible at adding them together or using them in any way. But he would remember the 7th of July for many reasons, one of which was a secret he would take to his grave. Okay, well, I want to read more. How about you? I do, however, have lots of book news. I finished three books and two of them were amazing. I've started four books and I would say three out of the four are also starting out really, really good. So I think that all adds up. Let me do a quick calculation here. Yes, that all adds up to a pretty darn good reading week. So let's get started. Let's start with a negative, Sean. <laughs> and it's not that negative, but I was quite disappointed by Fatima Asgar's uh, novel, When We Were Sisters. By the end, it's it won the Carol Shields prize for fiction, $150,000 US. And by the end of it, I wasn't sure why. <laughs> it wasn't very good. I gave it three stars. 
started out the first fifth, which is all I'd read up in, when at the time that the prize was announced. So I was sending out all these tweets and posting on social media and saying, based on <laughs> what I've read so far, it's richly deserving of the prize. By the end, I felt quite ripped off that it didn't go to either Suzette Mayer, the sleeping car porter, which I have a review of that. I'll put a link to that in the show notes or the collection of linked short stories by Gish Jen. Thank you, Mr. Nixon, which I also ended up loving except for the first story. And those are the only ones I've read from the long list or short list. But no, this was very mediocre by the end. Okay, so I'm not gonna do a full review. Fatima Asgar is a non-binary writer, so their pronouns are they, them. And they are a beautiful writer. They have published books of poetry. Lindy has read them and she's a big fan. The writing here was quite poetic and mostly just gorgeous prose. The novel left a lot to be desired in terms of the story and even the character development. I, and I'm about to reveal my own prejudice, but I thought it read by the end like a why, like an unsatisfying YA novel. And all YA novels are pretty much unsatisfied on the book maniac, but it read like kind of a mediocre YA novel. It was about a set of three girls. They were so indistinct from each other that there may have been four, but I think it was three girls. And the story is told by one of them, and she eventually becomes either transgender or non-binary. That part of the end of the story was so vague that I'm not sure. I'm going to take a wild guess non-binary, like the author, but I shouldn't put too much stock in that guess. There, I'm meaning the sisters, their mother had died when they were babies or something, and then their father was murdered when they were, you know, all under the age of 10 or something like that. And they were kind of reluctantly adopted by a paternal uncle and taken to another. Th th this all happened in the States. I think the mother, I don't remember where the mother died, maybe back in Pakistan, maybe not. But the father was murdered in, this, in America and then they were transported by the uncle several across several states to where he lived with his white wife and family. And the only way he could adopt them was the white wife didn't want to ever see them or have anything to do with them. So he put them into an apartment building or something that he was renting for business purposes. And I think those business purposes were pretty shady and it involved, I don't know, pets or wild animals for some purpose. There was animal shit all over the stairs and they were in, in this one room in, in the building and told to fend for themselves. And he would check in on them very, very rarely. So that was a pretty interesting opening premise, but I lost my investment in the story because it went on in uninteresting ways and got very blasé in the middle about kind of coming of age, going to high school. There was some bullying because of racial issues and that was well done. All of it was well written, but it was, became a really ordinary kind of boring story. It kind of started reminding me of the shittiest book. It's not as shitty as, it's not shitty but it started to remind me in many ways of the shittiest book ever written, which is, it's not where the red fern grows. It's, it was made into a movie and the author apparently murdered somebody years ago in Africa. Uh, crab apples grow where the, uh, set in a marsh in one of the Carolinas or something. Anyway, it's my most watched video on my channel. <laughs> I had to read it for the booktube prize. Uh, where the Radford? No, anyway. It started to remind me of that. I, I will have put the cover gif. I will have sorted all this out in post-production and put the cover gif up so you know what I'm talking about. And it started to remind me of that book, which is not a good sign for Sean the Book Maniac. The ending was really unsatisfying, and I just wasn't sure what the point of it was by the end. So I don't think it d at all deserved the prize. Uh, yet I'm glad that Fatima Asgar got the money. <laughs> but, I, but I don't think they should have got the prize, so... Yes, as usual, the book prizes do disappoint me in the end. This one did in the, at the very beginning. So no, I didn't like it at all. I can't say that I hated it because the writing was really good and it started out really good. It had a lot of promise. And I think I would read something else that Fatima Osgar published in the future, but I might wait a couple, a couple more books before I'm willing to try again. So that happened. And I am in a fairly distinct minority because it has 3.96 rating, so uh, a, a lot of readers liked it far better than I did. I am being accurately harsh because 
this book has won a major, the most major, the most lucrative book prize in the world. So it's fair game for, I don't have to pull my punches. I didn't like it. Everything else that I finished, oh my God, can we talk? Oh, 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 oh. I finished on audio, Take What You Need by Idra Novi. And it's fairly, quite a new book. Just came out, I think, in middle of March. Idra Novi, Novi, oh, I don't know how it's pronounced. Let me look that up. Kendra had her on her podcast. Her podcast is called Read Appalachia, and it's wonderful. You should check it out. And the most recent episode features this author and the audio narrator talking about Appalachian accents. I can't make it play, so I have to find something else out. Hello, everybody. I am really pleased to, to welcome Idra Novi. I'm, I'm excited to be here. Idra Novi. Now I'd have, I've spent so long looking that up, I have no idea what that sentence started out to be. But anyway... I love this novel, and you know what? I'm not going to say very much about it because I have so much to say that I'm going to do a separate full review. Stay tuned for that probably quite soon. The present of the story happens during the uh, Republican primaries that got doofus douchebag Trump, that he won to become the Republican nominee, so that was 2016 or maybe 2015 when he became the nominee. So it's set then, and it's set in dirt poor, in a dirt poor town in Appalachia, and I don't remember. In the Allegheny Mountains, and I don't remember which state the town was in, but it's about a stepmother and a mother. Well, it's hard to make the terminology clear. It's about a stepmother and her stepdaughter. It's a step relationship between the two women, an older woman and a younger woman who's also herself a young mother. A stepmother and her stepdaughter. So when I say mother from here on in, I'm talking about the younger of the two women. I believe the mother is in New York City, and her stepmother, who's the only mother she, she ever knew as a child, is in Appalachia. And there's two storylines. One is the stepmother has become passionate about sculpting, using a welder and putting together metal objects and uh, building structures that tell about and heal her from her own life and she is following in the footsteps of two famous sculptors only one of whose name I remember uh, Louise Bourgeois and so there's a lot about her process and stuff and she ends up befriending the next door kid he's about 20 years old Elliot and they have a very unconventional friendship shall we say that to me was the heart of the book and I loved their relationship so much in the way that it was portrayed then the stepdaughter her storyline later where the stepmother has died and left her sculptures to the stepdaughter and so she's on her way on a road trip back to where, where she grew up this rinky dink little town that is full of rednecks and white supremacists and she has a lot of trepidation about going back there and that's basically the premise it was so well done and it just grabbed me by the heart that uh, there was a couple imperfections that I was getting that at certain points I was nervous was going to ruin it or bring it down to a four star read, but no, no, it ended so beautifully and such a powerful novel. I'm so glad that Kendra put it on my radar, and I'm going to now listen to the podcast episode where she interviews both the author, Idra Novi, who narrated the stepdaughter's half of the story, and the other audio narrator, Christina Delane who did the stepmothers. The audiobook was really well done and I didn't have, I couldn't affordably get a copy of the ebook or anything. So I'm gonna buy a physical hardcover copy because I loved the book that much. But it was the kind of audiobook that I didn't need to refer to a text because I couldn't help but focus deeply on what I was hearing in my headphones. So it was a wonderful reading experience, very rich. Stay tuned for my review. I wanna save all the rest of what I have to say about it. For that. And last night I finished this Australian novel, Friends and Dark Shapes by Cavita Bedford. And I will be definitely buying a, a, my own copy of this too. This is obviously a library book. I'll put it down and put the cover gift up because I loved it too. Five stars. And I have lots to say about it, so I'm going to do a full review of that. I've got two that I'm champing at the bit to create reviews for. But this was just so thoughtful and almost meditative and it's essayistic in a way that totally worked for me and so full of heart in a way that was completely stripped of any sentimentality. I just fell in love with the protagonist who's a young 
Indian Australian woman whose dad has just died and so she's grieving and she's living in a share house with a motley crew of young Australians she's so open and loving towards them and that's kind of how she's dealing with or not dealing with her own grief but that doesn't get her very far so the novel's kind of about the push-pull she's so drawn to other people and she's so such a deeply perceptive and observant narrator and character in the novel that everybody loves her and again, I'm using the word love a lot for a novel that is not sentimental, and I don't know how she did it, because she totally did it. It was just a wonderful novel, just full of these small moments that were the whole point of the story. <laughs> ah, stay tuned for my review. Cavita Bedford. I hope she comes out with more soon. I'm just so excited by what I, by what I read. It's the kind of excitement that is just, it's made up of a, of a contentment and almost uh, like a... A sense of solace from the prose. Um, it's 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 the literary equivalent of what a devout Christian might get from going to church. That's what it is. And I don't go to church, and I'm not a devout Christian. But this is the literary equivalent of that. It was beautiful. I loved it so much. Stay tuned for my review. So that's what I finished, and I have started, I think, four. And because I'm reading so many books at one time. Usually my report on the, the books that I've started the week before is just based on the first 20 pages, and that is definitely true for all of these. Because <laughs> that's as much as I've gotten read of any of them. So I have started The White Tiger by Aravind Attica, and I'm doing this as an audio text combo. This is not one that I'm listening to down on the treadmill, I'm doing it with the book open in my lap, and I have read about 20 pages, exactly 20 pages, and just in terms of the writing, I can already see what the fuss is about. It's beautifully written and it's a very interesting story, but I haven't even got enough of, an, of the opening premise to, to really even try to describe it. It's narrated by Balram Hawai, servant, philosopher, entrepreneur, murderer. He's riffing on how he's described in the Wanted poster about him, and getting, I'm getting introduced to his childhood. And it's all, I don't know if the entire novel is, but at least the chapter I'm reading, is addressed to the then premier of China, Wen Zhaobao. Very interesting. Also very interesting is this doorstopper of a book, The Ecological Buffalo, On the Trail of a Keystone Species. And the text is by Wes Olson, I now know, and the photographs are by his wife, Johanne Janelle. It's just captivating. Gorgeous photographs, as I showed last week and a really fascinating story. If you live almost anywhere in North America, buffaloes were part of your environmental history. Here is a map. And the, the pinkish is the wood bison, the yellow is the plains bison, and the little bit sliver of orange is mountain bison. So this is how much of North America, at one time in history, had bison ranging on it. And they're all gone, and this is the story. Environmental, historical, lots of indigenous history in here. Neither the writer or the photographer, as far as I can tell, are indigenous. There is at least one afterward by an indigenous writer or chief or something. And uh, yeah, I won't say try to say more than that, but it's certainly holding my interest. But it's the kind of book that I have to be... It's just physically a very heavy book, so I have to kind of plan when I'm going to read it and do I have enough strength to lift it, but I'm enjoying it. I was a little bit underwhelmed by the first story in Tyna by Norma Dunning. It, the full title is Tyna, the Unseen One's Short Stories. It's kind of an awkward title, I think. When I held this up last week, I didn't know what kind of an indigenous writer, what, where, what nation Norma Dunning was from, and Lindy clarified that Norma Dunning is an Inuit writer, and that brought back the memory that, yes, I did know that at one time. This is a buddy read with, I've now got everything clarified. What? Can, how can I refer to this buddy reader friend of mine? And I have gotten permission to just use her name, Katie, who who, who comments under Homo Libraia, Libraiensis. I still can't pronounce that name, but Katie, henceforth known as Katie. Her real name. We're buddy reading this. She liked the short story a little better than I did. There were things I liked about it, but it felt read to me like anecdote. It didn't read like shapely short fiction. And I'm hoping that I will like the other ones better. And finally, I have read about 20 pages of 
This memoir, All Down Darkness Wide, by Sean Hewitt. Oh my god, the writing is just gorgeous! It's so gorgeous that you have to read it really slowly. I'm actually 24 pages in. Some or all of the story happens in Liverpool, and it has this gorgeous opening. That an extended scene setting of the oratory of St. James Cemetery in Liverpool and describes the history of it, the physicality, the architecture, the environmental profile of all the trees and bushes and stuff. I think even the birds, including that there is a spring leaking along the walls and through one of the family vaults. And the, the, the way he ties all that together is beautiful. And he actually is standing there in that cemetery, cruising. And then we find out that he's recently single after breaking up with his lover of several years, Elias. And Elias had been suffering, or maybe still was at the time of the breakup, with a really severe depression. And so that's how this memoir opens. And the writing is gasworthy. Sean Hewitt was born in Cheshire. I think he might have Irish family in his ancestry. But he lives in and teaches in Dublin now. Uh, he's written a book, I don't know if it's a biography or a work of literary criticism, on the Irish writer J.M. Singh. And at the time this was published, one poetry collection, which apparently is to die for. And this is already to die for. This is going to be something really special. I can tell. All right, so I'm going to start four, maybe five books because this is just the way that I ridiculously roll. The audiobook this week is going to be Are You There, God? It's Me, Margaret by Judy Bloom. because the movie, it's out probably where you live, but where I live, it's not out yet, but it's probably coming very soon, and I I can't remember if that's one of the Judy Blooms that I read. I must have when I was a teenager, when I was a little girl. Do you know where I get that expression from? It's not necessarily a gay comp. It, I don't mean it in the gay way, although it certainly applies to but my grandfather used to say that to my mom when she was a little girl and she misbehaved and he would say to her my mom when I was a little girl I never did things like this so I read lots of Judy Bloom I think and I must have read it but I have no memory of it and it's time to rectify that so I have purchased the audiobook on sale at audiobooksnow.com which is one of my go-to places, I use Libby in the library as much as possible, but oftentimes, if it's a popular new book, I have to wait far too long. So I buy a copy, because the prices there are the best that i found. And there's no membership bullshit subscription. You, well, the subscription is $5 US a month, and then everything is like 50% off anywhere else. So I've been using them for about a year or so. I think that audiobook is only three hours, so it's quite possible that I will finish it and move on to the next audiobook. And if that happens, it's going to be the audiobook of How to Pronounce Knife by Suvankam Tamavongsa, a Thai Canadian writer. And this is a collection of short stories, very famous, won all kinds of prizes. And I might just do it on audio if it's easy to listen to without needing the benefit of the text or as an audio text combo, so we'll, we'll play that by ear. I may or may not get this one started. The three others that I will be starting. Georgia, are you paying attention? Sit up, pay attention. I'm finally gonna be starting The Handsome Monk and Other Stories by Sering Dondrup, translated from the Tibetan by Christopher Peacock. Sering Dondrup is a Tibetan writer. I'm assuming he wrote it in Tibetan, but I don't know that with 100% certainty. I have been threatening to, to read this ever since I first hauled it, and Georgia especially has been waiting for me to read it, and I really want to get to it. So finally, as part of the Asian Readathon, I'm gonna start this collection of short stories. I want to participate as much as I can in a book club that's over on Litzy. And if you don't know anything about Litzy, Litzy is like a standalone bookstagram. So it's, it's a very similar style to that, but it's a standalone app, Litzy. And I, discovered Litzy before I discovered booktube so I was very active on it for years and then once I got into booktube it was hard to stay active on both but I still dip in as often as I can. In fact that's how I met both Lindy and Leah who are two of my bookish besties that was through Litzy. And Leah is running, I think she's the head honcho, she usually is, of uh, Four Old Middlebrow Book Club this year. And this is their May selection, so I'm going to be starting it a little late. 
Yoked with a Lamb by Molly Clavering. I had a did a bite-sized book chat with Marilyn Maya Mendoza about another book by this author. What was it called? Mrs. Lorimer's Quiet Summer. And I have that book on the shelf because Marilyn Maya Mendoza sold it to me so well. But this is the selection for this month uh, for the uh, For Old Ben Abroad Book Club over on Litzy. She's a Scottish writer. Born in Glasgow, 1900, died 1995, and this book was published in 1938. So does that sound like a Sean book, or does that sound like a Sean book? Yoked with a Lamb is an odd title, and I'll tell you more about the book next week. And finally, Sonia and I are going to be starting our buddy read of the next, in our chronological buddy read of the complete works of Edna O'Brien. And this is her 1966 novel. That was a good year. Certain someone was born in that year. And it is Casualties of Peace. I just have a, a library book I picked up at the university yesterday, so I'll put it down and put up a cover. But this one is not in print, which maybe doesn't bode well for it being a memorable novel, but we'll soon find out. Sonia and I are doing it as a two-week buddy read. So I'll be half done by this point next week. Can you hear the geese? That is my report. Thanks for watching. Thank you.